Thanks very much, Mariana, and it's lovely to be with you this morning. Um, I hope you find it interesting and uh, useful as well. Um, before we do start, I just wanted to remind you um, on the, uh, the next slide, the disclaimer um, that um, I'm not a licensed financial advisor and that um, uh, I can't give you uh, financial advice because obviously I don't know your personal circumstances. Okay, let's uh, start again by moving to the first major slide um, titled Markets Have Delivered Pleasing Returns for Investors Over Most Time Periods. And what we are seeing here to the end of June, so these are very recent um, market uh, returns, are the returns for various asset classes. Over on the left, left as you can see, we've got Australian shares, then global shares, uh, listed property in the middle, and various categories of bonds and cash as we move to the right of the diagram. And we're looking at the returns of each of those asset classes to the end of June for the periods one year, which is the orange colored uh, column, five years and 10 years. And what is striking about this diagram is that returns for nearly all of those asset classes have been positive in each of those time periods, um, especially in the last 12 months where uh, returns have been uh, very positive. So I guess if you're looking at your account balance today and comparing it with where it was a year ago, there's a very, very good chance that it will be much higher as a result of those market returns than where you were one year ago. Let's move on to the next slide and what we're looking at here is purely the market returns of various uh, share markets around the world. Again, we're talking about the one year to the end of June. So you can see most of the uh, most of those asset class, uh, pardon me, most of those share markets have delivered positive returns in the last 12 months, with Germany the only exception. But of course, very strong returns from the USA, Japan and uh, Australia down towards the bottom with a return of 13%. Although as we can see, a lot of the return for the Australian market came from the resources sector of the market. Now, why have markets been so positive? Uh, well, that's evident from the next slide. Just focus on the blue line. The blue line is measuring global growth, economic growth, uh, measured on the left and right hand scales. And we're looking back from 2006 over on the left to the first quarter of 2018 over on the far right. And what has been notable about the uh, economy, global economy in the last 12 months is that economic growth has strengthened. And that's because uh, we are seeing a much more synchronized pattern of global growth. If we were sitting here a couple of years ago, we would have been talking about China and the US economies doing well, but Japan and Europe lagging. Well, what we saw last year was a, a vast improvement in economic conditions in the Eurozone and much more sustainable growth, albeit not as strong, but nonetheless more sustainable growth coming out of Japan. So uh, very positive for markets. You can see also the red line, uh, which is also measuring economic growth for the Australian economy. Um, not as strong as the global growth, uh, but nonetheless still positive. And as you can see further back, Australia avoided falling into recession during the global financial crisis. Uh, on the next slide, um, which is looking at global earnings per share growth, uh, obviously with such strong economic conditions around the world, that's been very positive for earnings growth. Uh, by corporates. So you can see 2017 was a very strong year um, with well over um, uh, 12, 13% earnings growth. And looking ahead, both for this year and next year, still some earnings growth expected from corporates. So that's certainly been helpful to share markets around the world also. A very good way to look at how strong economic growth has been and the recovery uh, around the world since the global financial crisis 10 years ago 
is looking at the unemployment rates, which is shown on this slide. Uh, and you can see, uh, especially in Europe, we're seeing much lower unemployment rates. Although as you'd appreciate in, a, in an economic zone as vast as the Eurozone, conditions vary from country to country. Uh, but also the star performer, as you can see, the blue line is the United States. And you can see back in 2009, because of the GFC, substantial numbers of people in America lost their jobs and unemployment in the space of a year and a half virtually doubled to over 10%. Well, you can see that downward sloping line is suggesting the Americans have done a very, very good job in getting, getting their people back to work, creating new jobs and stimulating the economy. In fact, now we see in America, unemployment is at decades low at around about 3.7, 3.8%. So full marks to the Americans for getting their economy back on, uh, on very strong uh, ground. Australia's um, economy continues to do okay, but unemployment seems to be fairly sticky at around about 5.5%. And the consequences of that we will discuss in a few moments. So moving on to the next slide, there's been a lot of publicity in the last uh, couple of months about the Americans' decision to impose uh, selective tariffs on um, various goods and services, in particular the specific targeting of Chinese imports. And this is partly uh, explained by this diagram. Uh, the black line is measuring in billions of US dollars the trade deficit that the US has. Um, a trade deficit is very simply the value of imports is greater than the value of exports. And as you can see on this diagram, it looks like the Americans have got a trade deficit of around about 800 billion. And if you look at the red line, nearly half of that trade deficit is uh, related to the trade deficit that America has with China. Uh, in other words, China is exporting more to America than it is buying from America. Now, I'll let you be the, uh, the judge of whether to, um, whether to support the US uh, administration's decision. Uh, are higher tariffs a, um, uh, likely to improve this situation? Um, there are fairly strong grounds to be skeptical that raising tariffs is actually going to improve the trade deficit situation. If anything, it's unsettled markets because uh, trade barriers uh, such as higher tariffs are not necessarily very good for global economic growth. So unfortunately, um, we do see continued speculation of higher tariffs on more and more goods and services. Um, and it remains to be seen um, how that will impact the global economy. It is a source of uncertainty. If you look at the next slide, which is showing the trade deficit for not only the United States way over on the right hand side of the diagram, but also a whole range of um, countries. And you can see the US certainly does have a trade deficit problem. Its trade deficit is probably one of the largest, if not the largest in the developed world compared to many countries. Uh, and countries over on the left like China and Germany and South Korea certainly don't have that problem. They have a trade surplus. In other words, they're exporting more than they are importing. If we move to the next slide, another source of uncertainty in markets in the last few months have been concerns that inflation in America could be higher than what markets were expecting. And those concerns were exacerbated in February this year when the wages growth in America was announced for the end of 2017. And you can see the blue line, which measures the change in average earnings in America through time has been increasing. It's been up on an upward sloping line for quite some time. 
the figure that was announced in February was much higher than markets were expecting. And that led to concerns of higher wages growth leading to higher inflation, which could force the US central bank to raise interest rates higher and faster than markets were expecting. Now you can see the red line, the American Federal Reserve commenced raising interest rates some time ago to try and keep uh, economic growth and inflation in check. But nonetheless, it looks like markets are going to have to uh, digest more interest rate rises in America. There are two more planned for this year and perhaps as many as three next year. So higher interest rates in America. Let's move from America to China, which is obviously very important to Australia as our largest trading partner and the destination for a substantial component of our exports, in particular iron ore. Um, China's uh, economy, economic growth, continues to be very strong compared to global peers. As you'll see from the red line measuring growth in industrial production and the blue line measuring retail sales, the growth rate isn't as substantial as it was earlier in this, um, in this decade. It was perhaps natural that China's growth would moderate to some extent, and that's certainly been the case. But you can still see that the growth of industrial production and retail sales is nonetheless still quite substantial with, for instance, retail sales growing at nearly 10% for the year. Moving on to the Australian economy now, we're looking at two, um, two indicators in this diagram. The red columns are measuring the quarterly change in Australia's economic uh, position. So anything above the line implies the economy has grown. Anything below the line suggests in that quarter, the economy went backwards. And what is striking from this diagram is that Australia has been doing pretty well. It hasn't been growing, I guess, as fast as the global economy, but its economic performance has been much more consistent since um, uh, 2006 over on the left diagram. So in that period of time, the Australian economy has gone backwards in only three of those quarterly uh, periods. The blue line is measuring the annual change in the Australian economy. It's measuring one year growth through time. Uh, and you can see now in the last 12 months to the end of March, which was the last quarterly observation that we have, the Australian economy grew at uh, just over 3% for the year. That's pretty substantial. If you look at the next slide, where is that growth coming from? Um, the National Australia Bank has a business conditions by industry survey that comes out periodically. And you can see uh, in the last year or so, the upward sloping lines, which indicates um, most, if not all of those industries that the um, NAB is surveying, um, are, uh, are looking uh, more positive. Even poor old retail, which has um, obviously been in the doldrums for quite some time, uh, is managing to show perhaps stronger conditions. But nonetheless, uh, it's good to see that the economic growth improvement in Australia is not because of just one industry, as we saw a number of years ago with the mining sector, but it's spread across a whole range of different industries, ranging from construction through to retail. Uh, and that those improved conditions measured by the NAB survey uh, is not only positive across a range of industries, but also positive uh, state by state uh, within Australia. And I guess that um, more buoyant market uh, situation that we've seen is translating, as you can see in the next slide, to better job creation and a rise in job advertisements. So it appears as the economy has been improving, more jobs are available for people who want to work 
and the annual change in employment has been quite strong. In fact, in the last 12 months or so, over 300,000 new jobs have been created in Australia. Um, and part of the reason why, if you can move to the next slide, um, part of the reason or a significant stimulus to the Australian economy, uh, which perhaps may not surprise any of you, especially those of you who live in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, um, are, is the massive infrastructure spending that has been going um, uh, underway. Um, massive infrastructure spending on transport infrastructure in particular by state and federal governments. And that uh, stimulus um, uh, is likely to continue for some years as some of those huge road and rail projects um, continue into the next decade. Um, however, it's not all it's not all good news as you would appreciate. I guess unfortunately it never is. One thing that is concerning uh, as measured by the red line in this diagram is that there is a still a fairly high, what we call underutilisation rate within the labour force. Um, there's still five and a half percent of Australia's eligible labour force that is without a job, measured by the unemployment rate. But the Bureau of Statistics also releases surveys of what are called underemployment uh, or measuring underemployment in the labour force. And what this means is that there are significant amounts of people with jobs, but they're not working as long hours as they would prefer. And for whatever circumstances, for example, they may be working part-time, whereas they would prefer full-time jobs. And because there is so much surplus capacity, therefore, in Australia's labour market, as you can see with the blue line, that has led to very low wages growth in Australia. If you have received a wages growth in the last 12 months of about 2% and don't feel that that is very much, well, actually, I hate to tell you, that's a pretty good uh, wage increase in the environment that we are in today. So until that underutilisation rate is uh, starts to come down, it's likely that wages growth will remain subdued for some time. And that is a fairly serious issue, um, certainly of concern to Australia's Reserve Bank as it looks to interest rate policy. Um, if you look at the next slide, low wages growth is occurring at a time when, as you can see with the blue line, the upward sloping blue line from 1988 on the left to the present, that household debt, the average, uh, the debt of the average Australian household has been rising considerably. Um, so that is a concern that many Australian households, perhaps especially in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, as a result of very high property prices, with high mortgages, indebtedness is actually very high in some households. Now that's not a problem with interest rate policy where we are at the moment, as shown by the red line, but it will represent a concern when interest rates start to rise. And I guess the impact on household budgets uh, as a result of when interest rates start to go back up. And that's also occurring, as you can see in the next slide, at a time when Australian households are also being squeezed by much higher health prices, uh, health costs, and certainly much higher utilities costs, such as electricity, where you can see in the last 10 years, electricity prices have just gone up and up and up. Um, so on the next slide, in this environment that we're in, with high household indebtedness, um, it's no surprise, therefore, that the growth in retail spending has actually been trending down for the last two or three years. Now, remember, China's retail sales growth was around about 10%. Ours is now down to about 2.5%. 
So that's perhaps showing through with some people being forced to um, curtail or wind back their retail spending because of higher household costs elsewhere. I did refer to what's happening in the property market. So let's look at the next slide, which is showing that house prices in Sydney and Melbourne uh, have certainly peaked and in a couple of cases appear to have, um, have uh, fallen. Uh, not by much, I might add. You can see that um, over the last seven years, property prices have, uh, have, have gone up quite substantially, certainly in Sydney and Melbourne. So a very small uh, fall that we've seen in the last uh, six months or so um, represents very little compared to how far house prices have already gone up. But it does look as if uh, the banks tightening up their lending policies and also uh, increasing the cost of lending to property investors is starting to impact on property prices on the east coast of Australia. Now, let's finish off our session this morning by looking at some tips and traps for investors, the things to do and the things not to do. And firstly, looking at short-term volatility. It's really nothing new. Uh, the media, unfortunately, does upset people uh, by preparing some fairly alarmist headlines that we see, usually after some fairly significant falls on share markets. Uh, but if you can look through those alarmist headlines and try and stay true to, true to your long-term investment strategy, we think you would be better off by ignoring the fear and staying with your long-term investment strategy. And doesn't it, often, um, doesn't it often occur that the media tends to overplay bad days on share markets, usually with headlines along the lines of $100 billion wiped off the value of shares. But whenever I see that, I often think, who is actually buying the shares that people are panicking and selling? It's other investors, so it probably makes sense for people to use weak market days to actually uh, buy good companies at much cheaper prices. The next slide also just reminds us that as long-term investors, uncertainty is quite normal. There will always be events, whether they're economic or uh, political or country specific that come out of left field that can have an impact on markets. Um, best to just view those purely as, um, as a normal part of a long-term investment cycle. And finally, we think you should be planning for a much longer life as you think about your superannuation strategies. This slide is showing life expectancy and what it suggests is that a woman aged 65 years um, of age today has a 50% chance of living well into her 80s, perhaps 88 years of age. And the same for males, uh, a 65 year old male has a 50% chance of living to 85. And on top of that, there's a pretty much a 50% chance probability that either of those people are going to live well into their 90s. So I think from a wealth creation perspective, this is a very clear message and a very good reminder that you should be planning for a long life, perhaps longer than you thought, and also a healthier life as people lead healthy lives due to better food, better health care, better medication and so on. So maybe, just maybe, when you're well into your 80s, you'll still be well enough and willing enough to want to travel overseas for a long holiday.
So I guess that's the key message that in your wealth creation strategies and the way you invest your superannuation, try and start saving early. Uh, try and do salary sacrifice because the way things are going, you're going to lead a much longer life and a healthier life and that means your savings are going to have to last you much longer than you thought. So that's pretty much from us. Um, thank you very, very much for ringing in and listening to our webinar this morning. We sincerely hope that you found it useful and interesting. Thank you.